That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Don't Breathe 2, the directorial debut of Rado Sagayas, uh, who, of course, was the writer of the first Don't Breathe, oh. uh, directed by Fetty Alvarez in 2016. Uh, it is being released August 13th, 2021, courtesy of Sony's Screen Gems. Okay, quick recap from Don't Breathe. A veteran named Norman lives in a house in Detroit. Norman Nordstrom. Norman Nordstrom. Mm -hmm. He is burglarized by a group of young people who it's like they find out that perhaps this man has a bunch of money in his house. They go burglarize him. The bulk of the film is him trying to defend himself from these intruders. But the gag is we find out in the basement he has a woman held hot captive who's responsible for the death of his daughter. And now he's trying to inseminate her to create a baby to replace the baby she took from him. <laughs> Ultimately, he um, gets away. Like, he kills some of the intruders. A couple get away. Norman wakes up in the hospital, and we see on the news that, like, he killed two intruders, and we never hear from the other two, so they don't report him, I guess. So, Don't Breathe 2, we... It starts with... Um, a house on fire. A house on fire, and then we see a young girl, like, in the middle of the street. Collapsing. Collapsed. She has a streak of white in her hair. And then we immediately fast forward eight years and we see that same girl, a little grown up, like running for her life. Like through the woods, a dog is chasing her. She hops the fence. She bumps into a man with a gun and we see that man is Norman. Played by Stephen Lang. Stephen Lang. And that's her dad. Mm -hmm. So we're told. But then if you remember the first film, you're like, oh, yeah, like, how are you? Also, he seems quite old to be her dad. Yeah. But she understands he's her dad and that her mother died in a fire. So uh, Norm in has like a nursery at his house, like where he grows plants and he must have a business because we see a woman who like old Michelle Rodriguez looking lady. Stephanie Arcilla, uh, her character is Hernandez. Her character's name is Hernandez? Mm -hmm. Okay. Who's an ex-military as well. Yeah, she's a veteran as yeah. well. Hernandez shows up with the like the van to pick up some plants. And it's clear that Hernandez and the young girl whose name is Phoenix um, have a connection. So she's saying, oh, can Phoenix come deliver with me today? No, no, no. Norman is obviously very strict. He's just trying to teach her survival, sk survival skills, keep her locked up in the house and homeschool her <laughs> um, for reasons that will make sense in a second. But ultimately, he says, yeah, she can go. Just, you know, keep her out of trouble. So they go, and the first stop they make is... The burned-out house. The burned-out house where... Oh, the word I was looking for is shrine, not altar. Okay. Phoenix has a shrine to her mother at this, like, dilapidated house. That's been just sitting there, burned out, a burned-out husk for eight years. Yeah. So she goes, delivers a flower, and while she's there, she hears a noise, like someone's in there. So she runs away, freaked out. Later we learn that noise. Which I'm about to say because I have to. So then they stop at the bathroom, like a public restroom. And she, Phoenix, the little girl, goes into the bathroom and this creepy ass man is in there. Seeming like he's going to like assault her. In the background of the story on the news, we see that there's a doctor who's on the run for like black market organ dealing. <laughs> okay. Which does that make, is that lucrative? Do people still do that? I don't know. I don't know what I don't, I don't know anyway, what y'all be doing out here, but in uh, Detroit on on the dark web or I don't in, in Detroit I don't know. But so immediately I assumed, oh, this guy might be a part of this. Like we need little girl lungs. Or oh, yeah, little girl organs. <laughs> uh huh. Okay. The gag is when she was at the house. That noise she heard was that man whose name is Raylan. Mm hmm. Played by Brendan Sexton III. So Raylan saw her at the house and followed her to this bathroom. And he was going to try to scoop her up. But Phoenix has this like Rottweiler that Norm and her have trained. And he's like vicious. So she tells the man like, listen, if you touch me, all I, or she says, all I have to do is snap my fingers and he'll bite your testicles off. And he's like, oh, sorry, I scared you. And she's like, who said you scared me? And she walked out. I thought that was cute. Mm -hmm. But... Norm lives in like a secluded area. And there's only one road that takes them out to the main road. So as so Hernandez drops old girl off, and then as she's ready to leave in the evening, the road is blocked by a truck. And this lady gets out of the van, which I could not believe, to go approach this truck 
filled with four men. To be fair, she's a veteran with, and she has a gun. Yeah, but that seemed real bold. Because she haunts and they don't move. But anyway, they end up killing Hernandez and then going to the house. And the reason they're at Norman's house is because they want the girl. Specifically the leader, Raylan. Because that girl is his daughter. Mm -hmm. And that little house that burned up in the beginning of the movie, that was like a crack house where they were cooking meth. So Raylan and his wife, or the Phoenix's mom, were like cooking and dealing meth. The house caught on fire. They all scattered like roaches. Norman kidnapped this little girl in the street because as we know from the first film, he's missing his daughter. So he wanted one. And he's just been raising her. So... Raylan wants his daughter back. A big port, like 30 minutes of the film is these bad guys in the house with Norman and Phoenix and they're fighting, trying to take her. Ultimately, they're successful in taking the girl and they think they've killed Norman. Because they set the house on fire. Because they set the house on fire while he's in there. But Norman escapes and Norman makes his way to where they've taken the girl. Now, you would think that, Ray, that the dad took the girl because he misses his daughter. But that's not true. He took the girl because the mom's not dead. The mom is alive. She's not well. She has like heart da damage because of like the crystal meth ingredients she inhaled during the fire. The burning of those ingredients, yeah. And this bitch needs a heart transplant and it needs to be taken from like a matching donor. So that's why they want the girl. They're going to have that doctor who they're in cahoots with stealing organs to do a heart transplant. And they are all, hang this band of criminals is hanging out in this abandoned hotel. We'll get to hotel. that because we need to talk about where it was filmed. But ultimately they're not successful because Norman makes his way to this abandoned hotel they're all living and operating out of. And he wrecks shop. Phoenix ends up killing her dad and her mom. Her mom inadvertently, but she kills her. And uh, Norman ends up dying from injuries. But before he dies, he tells Phoenix, listen, I'm a monster. I'm a murderer and a rapist. You don't need to be near me. But ultimately, Phoenix is like, no, like, I, I want to be with you. But he, he dies in her arms. So the end of the film is Phoenix going to... Uh, she talks about it twice before earlier in the film that there's some, like, covenant house, some sort of shelter. For children. Her for, homeless children. For homeless children. She really wants to go there. She really wants to go because we see her, like, daydreaming about playing with those kids because she never gets to leave the house. So she ends up going and meeting this cute little black girl who befriends her at the end. Yeah. Or is kind to her. Mm -hmm. Okay, this shit was crazy. The story is, like, like bananas. <laughs> It is, uh, which I can appreciate, and there are things that I did like about it, but it there, what, once we get to the mother, who's a character I really liked, uh, who's kind whose of, name we can't find. Right, the, the actress, and I can't place her. She's it's familiar to me, but she's kind of Jennifer Tilly-esque. Her voice sounds like Jennifer Tilly. Slash Tilly-esque. Helena Bonham Carter. Uh, I thought she looked like if you mix um, Lilo Rashawn with Kira Knightley. <laughs> she's beautiful. Yeah, you can see that. Uh, yeah. it, she's a little too beautiful to be a, a meth head uh that's well cool. don't say that now because Lindsay lohan might get mad <laughs> just kidding oh you've got perfect pitch uh anyhow she it 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 sails away into camp at the point where she comes and they're laying in the they're both awake when this doctor is supposed to like be hacking their chests open and when the mother leans over like grabs the daughter's hand and says she says that, the, and the, the theater just erupted yeah. in laughter. But well, to be fair, there were like forty people in the screening. Yeah. So, <laughs> so like thirty people left. It, but I mean, it's just. It was a good moment. It's good, a good moment, but over the top. It's especially juxtaposed with kind of the performance of the little girl in Stephen Lang, who I do really like. Um, it, it, yeah. There know. are a lot of cool moments in the film. It's very violent. You see a lot of like blunt force trauma to the head. Yeah, which is hard to which is watch. hard to watch. But it, it is quite violent. Um, the there's a scene where um, one of the bad guys attacks Norman, and he like takes like liquid skin, like that crazy glue that people put to seal wounds, and he shuts this man's mouth and nose mm -hmm. closed so he can't breathe. So they end up having to like cut a breathing hole through his cheek they jam a screwdriver in his yeah cheek. and then they have to and then he has to like cut his lips open with like a yeah. razor blade or something there, or a knife there are cringy there are a lot of violent cringy, cringy moments. moments yeah um uh the luck it's uh pedro luque who shot the first film as well as 
a lot of recent films like Body Cam, for instance, uh, has, comes back to lens it. And I, I do like the look of it. Uh, while we were watching it, especially with this hotel they're holed up, and like, where in Detroit is this? It did not seem like Detroit at all. Uh, yeah. And it was shot in over the pandemic in Serbia and Belgrade. The film looks good. I like how it looks, but mm -hmm. it does not feel like Detroit. Because right. Norm's house is so secluded. Like, where in Detroit would you have a house like this? And then, yeah, the hotel they're living in. Like, where in Detroit would you occupy an entire hotel and, like, pr like produce meth and, like, I don't know. And I think the storytelling is a little bit off. Um, it, it was written by Sagayas and uh, Alvarez, but it, it's unclear about whether... I, I thought it was unclear about whether they were organ traffickers or still drug dealers, but were yeah. colluding with the doctor. That There were just uh, certain beats that didn't quite... Makes well, sense. I yeah, I mean, obviously the overall story is insanely ridiculous, but I think being confused about how the meth people are connected to the doctor, that was not clear. But I think the biggest blip in the script for me is the only reason Norman is able to successfully um, like take over the hotel is because one of the bad guys, this Latino man, he we hear him say earlier in the film, like, what you're doing is not right. He says it more than once. Yeah. Like, what you're doing is not right. Well, because he, he's upset they leave the dog to he's die. He's upset they leave the dog. Then he's like, when he finds out that they're going to, like, kill this girl, to, he, he doesn't like that. So at a point when he has the opportunity to kill Norman, he says, listen, they're going to kill that girl, and that's not cool with me. That's what he says. Yeah. And then it's him who basically allows Norman to proceed. I thought that was really weak. The, like, the everything relied on this one character with this corny line basically pointing him in the right direction. All of the bad guys and their dialogue, are, I think, are pretty weak as compared to how it was interesting these teenagers, these troubled teens that are just trying to get out of Detroit were kind of the crux of... It's important to note that the mom is in a wheelchair and the, ho the hotel they're in has like a like a very deep swimming pool that's drained. Mm -hmm. So they're all loitering around the swimming pool and they have handcuffed Phoenix, the daughter, to the mom so she won't get away. But then the mom gets shot. Mm -hmm. The dad inadvertently shoots her. So she's unconscious and pushes her wheelchair, like the motorized wheelchair, forward towards the pool. So she falls in while the girl's attached, holding on for dear life. And then Phoenix has to cut her mom's arm off. That was a good scene. <laughs> that was a good scene. But where the mother is also explaining her condition to her child and how she's like, I'm going to need that heart. The way that the actress is speaking is in a pattern that's very similar to Tommy Wiseau's The Room. When the mother's like, yep, I got the results. I'm dying. I was very amused by it. I was too, but it's very The Room in that scene. Um, do you have anything else? Um... You, you're, oh, you're done. Uh, well, because my uh, battery's about to die. <laughs> I, again, I think the, the bad guys were a little hokey. and mm -hmm. I, w I wish that there had been a more elegant way to really finesse the, this creepy portion of this mother that is going to steal her daughter's heart. I really, I really, really liked the, the mom. And I kind of wish that maybe there was more of that. I think we needed to... I don't think we needed the 30-minute intrusion of the house. They could have just kidnapped the girl. I, I don't think we need the intrusion because yeah. that's that's aping the first film. But it does play well. Like, the girl and her survival skills, it, it, it is fun to watch. It does play well, but it's almost like we needed a little more characterization instead of just this ambiguity about where this girl came from in relation to how we know Norman Nordstrom. And I think we, did, we haven't really even gotten into um, Stephen Lang's change from a villain to the hero and how he's kind of come to this minimal his atonement i think is his retribution is minimal uh it's he, an interesting conversation yes because even from the first film he's not necessarily rape i mean he is raping the woman but he's doing it because he wants like retribution for his child and then in this film he's doing this to protect this girl but he kidnapped her so it's it how it's kind of navigating those traumas is still in a very exploitative way uh in a way that this sequel made it this almost feel like a Charles Bronson Death Wish sequel. Sure. And the character says, I'm a monster. And I would agree. He's definitely a monster. Like, what he's done is, like, inexcusable and undefendable. But it does make for an inter... It, it is interesting to feel for a character like that. Right. Like, we want him to succeed, but only because he's saving the girl. But I also like that Lang is front and center. You know, I've liked him since I saw him in Last Exit to Brooklyn with Jennifer Jason Lee uh, as a kid. And... Uh, yeah, and I think most people associate him with the 
uh, as the villain in Avatar, but uh, he's got such a, a fascinating filmography uh, to kind of parse through if you're unfamiliar with him. What would you give this film? I would watch it again because it's fun, but it's not great. I would give it two and a half out of five. I agree. I would give it two and a half out of five as well. Thank you. Thank you.